we've made some updates to to our architecture to simplify the the mechanics of it i guess you could say uh, and also to make it a bit more flexible uh, so we've started with reducing the number of instructions that are required to install and operate kubesteller which is a fantastic move in the right direction we've also uh, removed a lot of the moving parts behind kubesteller which creates uh, makes it a little less complex uh, to to maintain and also allows more places for people to contribute in native ways uh, like APIs rather than you know necessarily having to write code in go so I think all those things are positive we're also working towards something called a pluggable transport which will allow us to swap in and out the transport mechanisms in the past, we were uh, we were reliant on our own synchronization technology, which was uh, basically an adaptation from what we had learned from KCP. And uh, now we've uh, broadened our horizons and we're using OCM's clusterlet and some of OCM's technology at the heart of the architecture. In the future, we'll be able to uh, swap these parts out and use other transport mechanisms from other providers and projects around the open source community in an effort to be as open, flexible, and collaborative as possible. So I think I recapped that enough there, but we'll get on to the particulars. So, uh, and first and foremost, we have changes to the Kubesteller architecture. So Paolo, why don't you walk us through <clears throat> the updates that have been made over the past few weeks and how we're using Kubeflex and our first ever transport uh, swappable transport mechanism OCM. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, Andy, for the introduction. Mm -hmm. So we start reviewing the high level architecture for um, Kubestellar, uh, where we are um, based also on uh, pretty much the, the, the model that we've been advocating for a while. Um, and so the, the idea is that uh, we, we have this concept of uh, spaces. Uh, we've been talking about this for a while. A space essentially represents in some way is an abstraction that somehow represents a Kubernetes API server API and somehow also the associated controllers because that gives some kind of behavior to, to the space itself. And the user typically will interact with Kubestellar, uh, somehow will interact with Kubestellar through spaces. So, for example, we have this concept of workload definition space where the user can submit for example, placement policies and workloads. And the placement policy essentially defines the what, um, defines which part of the workload, the whole workload um, that goes, uh, where it goes, right? It defines where it goes in, in terms of the execution cluster, the workload execution cluster that we see on the right. For example, I have a deployment. I want to, this deployment to de deplo be de deployed on maybe two of these three clusters I see on the right. I can define a placement to, to basically deliver the deployment over there. And there is also another space is represented here on the bottom that uh, we sort of consolidated. You could have also a separate space for just the inventory, representing pretty much the inventory of the clusters. But for simplicity, we sort of consolidate, at least in this picture, we are viewing one. So we have an inventory and also what we call a transport space. As Andy uh, alluded before, we are moving to a pluggable architecture for the transport. So we can use the original um, sinker uh, that we've been using for a while. Or we can use also other projects. For, in, for example, right now, the first um, architecture we are focusing on, on the first actually pluggable transport we are focusing on now, we are uh, relying on the um, open cluster management uh, transport and uh, agent. And of, of course, we're also looking at others. And also we are looking at standardizing some of these interfaces, for example, for clusters we are considering. Uh, one of the most promising is the SIG multi-cluster inventory API. There is some momentum around uh, that API. Some other projects are also looking and somehow looking at adopting that API. And then, of course, uh, also between the, the workload definition space and the inventory and transport space, especially the transport space, uh, another API that is being standardized by the SIG multi-cluster is the work API. That's another one that also we've been considering here. Um, let's move on. Um, I just want to say a few more words on the Kubestellar spaces. 
um, Andy already alluded that we've been sort of simplifying our stack and simplifying, so we decided to sort of converge uh, what was uh, initially just a provider of spaces, Kubeflex and the space manager, because the functionality in a way can be seen uh, as, a, as very related. So just pretty much merging these two components together. Now we have this uh, new space manager. This essentially is uh, the Kubeflex uh, project we've been working on for a while. As I said, the space is essentially representing a Kubernetes API server related controllers and Kubeflex is now the space manager for a Kubestellar. And right now we have a different uh, type of spaces that uh, can be uh, supported by uh, Kubeflex. So we can add more because it's uh, actually very flexible and extensible. Uh, the main spaces that we are using is the K8S space. So this represents, essentially it's a vanilla Kubernetes, upstream Kubernetes API server, plus a subset of uh, controller manager um, controllers uh, for some of the basic features that are still required in a Kube API server, for example, a namespace controller or garbage collection controller, or other things that you, you need to have to have some basic functionality there. But the workload, many of the controllers are related to workload, like deployment controller, pod controller, nodes controller, those are disabled. So this allows us to achieve the kind of um, denaturing behavior that we need so that you can apply some particular workload resource on this space. And then um, that, that, that doesn't trigger the creation of pods somehow in the, specifically on that space, but we can actually have other controllers like the Kubestellar controllers that are picking up those workload objects and wrapping them and transferring them to uh, our delivery mechanism to the target cluster. That's exactly the behavior that uh, we wanted to have to provide this kind of Kube native API upfront. We do support also other type of spaces, for example, vCluster. Um, that's a, there is a lot of traction around, right now in community for vCluster, and there are use cases where running some pods in that particular space makes sense. For example, one use case we have is for, uh, especially for kind of dev environment where you are kind of limited in resources, so you, you don't really have a big requirements. You can run, for example, an instance of open cluster management there. Uh, we actually automate. Uh, the installation to make it really easy for users to, to use it without having to explicitly go and install yourself in some other cluster and so on. We have also other types, uh, for example, host is relatively new and the idea is uh, you can also use your hosting cluster where you're running Kubeflex and Kubestella to basically as a space. So you may have some use case where actually this may be useful. Um, and then there's also the case of where you just have other clusters outside, you want just to import them as external clusters. For example, you may use an external cluster as a workload definition space. Maybe you don't want to install anything on that cluster. Maybe you're running something like Kubeflow on the cluster, you don't want to install Kubeflex or Kubestellar there, you can just import the cluster and use that as a WDS. Um, same thing you can do also if you want to use that as a, for example, if you want to use that for transport, like you have an uh, OCM cluster running somewhere else, uh, you want to use that. And we have also other example, there is also this um, multi-cluster control plane that is like a light OCM instance and so on. So in the future, probably based also on use case on requirements or interest from community, we may consider actually extending, adding more types. Let's move on to uh, the actual architecture for uh, 020. So after seeing the sort of abstract architecture I wanted just to give some more concrete um, view of how the architecture looks like in the upcoming release of 020. <clears throat> well, we're moving to 020 because again, as uh, Andy said, this is sort of um, updated architecture. Uh, they, the API, the user experience in, in a sense is pretty much the same, doesn't really change that much. The, the, the whole idea that you can pretty much apply a placement, you can apply workloads on, on the WDS and then deliver them. That doesn't really change. But what changes is really to simplify the way you pretty much you set up, uh, install and, and operate the system. And so after you pretty much install the, the, the Kubeflex, uh, that is pretty much one step. You just have one installer. You can just also use Elm chart to install. Is up to you. You can use the, the Kflex CLI, you can use the Helm chart. Uh, 
to install in a hosting cluster. It can be kind cluster, for example, or Kubernetes cluster, it can be OpenShift cluster. We support that. Once you have that, pretty much you have your running hosting cluster with uh, Kubeflex, um, the, the controller manager that is basically uh, give you the ability now as a space manager to create spaces. And now you can do things like create. You see the first step is to create a space of type uh, inventory and mailbox. So we're using the term inventory and mailbox or inventory and transport. We're probably going to move to transport in the future. And that essentially um, provision a vCluster that you see in the picture on the right, um, a vCluster uh, type space. And uh, also we have this concept of uh, um, plugins of um, post create hooks that allow you to run arbitrary controllers or installation steps automatically after a space is created. In this particular case, we have a plugin um, called OCM. Essentially, what it does, it, it triggers a job that we use the CLI for uh, OCM, the cluster ADM CLI. It will install OCM on that uh, particular space. And OCM has a concept of uh, namespaces um, that are used to essentially as a mailbox to deliver content to clusters that are need to be wrapped. This workload needs to be wrapped into manifest, so-called manifest work. And then there is also a concept of managed cluster that is the inventory somehow representing the clusters. Once you have that, then the next step is simply to run another one line command that will create a WDS space. Um, and this, what is going to do also, um, we have to update, by the way, this chart because it's actually now um, called Kub Kub Stella. It's going to install a control, uh, it's going to create a space of type uh, K8 test that is a vanilla Kubernetes. API server, as I mentioned before, and also is going to run, um, install and run a controller uh, pointing to that particular space. And that's really the Kube Stellar controller. There are a couple of more steps that are really about uh, somehow registering the, um, the cluster, um, the workload execution cluster. You need to create them and to register them now with the, um, with the OCM. Um, and then after that, you are ready to go, right? You can start doing things like applying a placement uh, policy. You can submit a workload and pretty much everything works as before, right? So now you have this flexibility to, with one command to create, if you need, for example, another workload definition space, I can do that. I can create another one, for example, for another set of users. Um, and then I can just apply placement and workloads there. Um, for, so in terms of this architecture, just a few highlights how pretty much this works. Uh, the idea is that once a user submits uh, um, a workload and a placement, the Kubestella controller manager is actually watching those resources, watching all the, the workload, all the type of um, resources, the, the resources that eventually you want to deliver. He has actually um, informers there that have started dynamic informers looking at those resources. And uh, and also looking at the placement. So whenever there is a new object, essentially uh, the the controller manager will look at the placement and will figure out which placement are matching a particular object. And then based on that, is going to find where this need to be delivered. And then it's going to wrap that into manifest work. It's going to deliver to the namespace. And from there, the transport will take care of deliver to the final cluster. And that's pretty much the high-level uh, inner work.